Thanks for coming to the summit. My name is Rich Bergman. I'm the president of Wisconsin Youth Rugby. The feedback we get from the coaches that are my generation, if you played in the 80s and the 90s, there was no such thing as rugby strategy. It was hit the guy with the ball, or if you have the ball, just run with it. It's beautiful to see what's come through and the college coaches that have came through and brought actually strategy and tactics to rugby. It's night and day. Yeah, I dated myself. I'll get over that. So we have the head coach of Wisconsin Rugby Club here. And now you guys are D1. It just moves up to D1 level in Ooh. one year. Personal friend of mine, uh, I'd like to welcome Nick, talking about defensive strategies, something that I'm just learning about after 50 years of rugby. So, again, thank you all. There's defensive There is. Is there defense strategies in rugby? <laughs> thank you. Um, and I said it in my first session, but I have not seen something like this event in Wisconsin in my time. So if you get a chance to find one of these guys in white polo shirts or one of the ladies in white polo shirts, please thank them for putting this thing on. I'm hoping this goes year after year after year. Um, yeah, just a bit about myself. I've been playing rugby for 23 years. I still find myself on the field from time to time. I try to limit those times. Uh, right. Body's taken a bit of a beating. Um, but I've been coaching for about 17 years now. I started uh, with high school, moved up to college, coached at a couple different colleges. Um, now I'm coaching men's club, and I'm actually really happy to be back. Um, just for people from my own personal experience, if you try to turn, well, I tried to turn rugby, which is a passion, into my full-time job, and it was really rewarding because I learned a lot through that process, but you also lose a lot of the parts that you love about it. Um, you lose kind of the social aspect, you lose like the camaraderie of it. Um, so I, like, keep working on it, keep working on your passion about it, but I would just put it in that list of priorities where it belongs for you. Um, you know, moving from playing to coaching, uh, I've, I've said it said it this morning, I've said it before, like you you lose that really visceral competitive feeling when you're on the field, but that's replaced by the more like cerebral, you've been working on this thing for six months and you see it happen on the field. Like that's a very satisfying, fulfilling thing to see. So just a bit different. Um, the first uh, question I have is, does anybody in the room have a favorite international team to watch for defense, and I'm going to ask you to explain why they're your favorite. Jay? South Africa because of Fat the Clerk. South Africa because of Fat the Clerk. I think that's a completely reasonable reason. There's honestly the past five years there's not been another team that plays like them. Um, they're so solid and so structurally solid that they let their their uh, scrum half Fat the Clerk just do whatever, whatever, he whatever he wants to do to disrupt the other team. So I agree, that's fun to watch. Any other favorites around the room? Favorite international rugby team to watch for defense? Or it could be a professional team? Yep. I like watching Japan. Japan? Because they're not physically dominant, so they technically have to do everything perfectly. Yeah. Otherwise, they get run over. Yeah, so he said Japan uh, because they're not physically dominant, so they have to be super technically sound and win in other ways, and I 100% agree. Um, and actually, I would pick my favorite is South Africa. Um, for me, for three reasons, uh, physicality, teamwork, and aggressive line speed. Um, you know, they do have the size that Japan doesn't have, but they use their size and their physicality uh, intelligently. They try and pressure the other defense, or the other team into making mistakes, turning the ball over, and then capitalizing. And I do have, have on here, and not a joke, Japan's my second favorite team to watch play defense because of the same reasons. They take advantage of their, their fitness, their, their team speed, to beat the other team in different ways. And so I think that kind of shows you two different teams, two different player makeups, but they're both very successful in what they're trying to do. So just very simply, what are the objectives of defense in rugby? Stop the ball. Stop, the ball. Turn yeah, stop them from moving forward. Good. Retain possession. Yep, retain possession, absolutely. Force turnovers. Force turnovers, yep. Slow down. Slow down the other team. Cool. Yep, I agree with all of those. They're all absolutely right. I think pretty easily they kind of mirror the uh, principal, principles of play that you'll learn about rugby. So just looking at those six principles of play, how, how do those apply to defense? Or if you're on defense, how can you achieve those those principles? Score 
points as counter attack. So, uh, where is that? Score points, yeah, would be counter attack, creating a turnover, and then scoring off of that. Yep. Creating continuity constantly back in your the offense up as you, you know, three yards back, three yards back at a time. Yeah, so he said creating continuity phase after phase after phase. Maintaining your shape, maintaining your strategy on defense through multiple phases. Okay. For applying pressure, just always get off the line quick and be a foot in a phase. Yep. Every time. Applying pressure is consistent line speed. I completely agree. But I just threw some ideas in there. Again, go forward, line speed, provide support to defending groups. Don't defend as individuals. Create continuity. Get your line set up for the next phase before the next phase starts. Apply pressure, line speed, breakdown skills, score points through transition, and then uh, contest possession, and that can be done a couple of different ways. Any comments on there or stuff that I missed that, that could also be considered ways to accomplish the principles of play? Cool. No worries. So now I'm going to talk about there's, you know, with the modern game, with it being professionalized, there's kind of an infinite amount of defenses you could run. You could specialize in any one area. But again, there's two main styles that teams play. It's a drift and a blitz. Um, and if you were here for, for Snacks' presentation, there will be a little bit of the same ground, but we're going to cover it a little bit differently. Um, can people give me examples or, or characteristics of either drift or blitz defenses? What's that? So in drift, you give up some, some space on the outside. Yep. Blitz is proactive, drift is reactive. Okay, that's a good way to think about it. Uh, you said blitz is proactive, drift is reactive. I would say that that's correct. Others? Drift is an inside out, or a blitz is an outside in. Yep, 100%. Drift, inside out, blitz, outside in. Cool. Yep, great examples. So, you know, my thoughts kind of mirrored what you guys are saying. Drift is very patient, inside out, more of a bend, not break mentality. Blitz, aggressive, outside in, high risk, high reward. Okay, kind of similar to what Snacks' presentation was if you were here last time. Um, blitz defenses are newer, but they've become very popular in professional rugby. It's really about putting the pressure, not, not being on defense and taking pressure from the opposition, but putting the pressure on the attack. Um, can anybody think of a defensive style that doesn't fall into one of these two buckets? Um, some people call it inch, banana, or umbrella, where you have a specific pod of your defense is kind of shooting up and the rest of it is flecked off of that. Okay, I think the umbrella kind of falls under the blitz. The blitz. Yeah, it's, the blitz. it's a little bit more specific about which players are coming up the field. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Sweet. Okay, so. I've got a couple of videos here. Um, you know, I don't want to just keep speaking. Uh, this first one, there will be some uh, professional English players or former professional English players that will kind of speak to the difference. Well, yeah. A little look at the difference. The, the drift defense, you're trying to drift and push the opposition out towards the touchdown. But I'm doing it here against Leicester, actually. And you'd think actually it'd be a, a little bit closer to the try to do it, but they just drift. They're all working hard on the inside, talking to each other. And it's a lot more passive defense, but you tend to make a lot less errors doing it this way. You can lose a bit of space on the outside, but you tend not to miss as many tackles as opposed to your. Yeah, well, if, if the drift is all about from the, from the inside moving out towards the touch line, the blitz defense is the tackle opposite. It's about getting up on the outside and trying to force the attackers back inside. Quite high risk, but hopefully quite high reward. Uh, we just say Saracens, you've got uh, top kids there, just up there, rushing up on the outside and forcing Cook, Rob Cook there, the Gloucester defence on the inside. And it really is about total commitment for the whole defensive line. We see another little curve there where they, they're just trying to force the guys on the inside, which means that you work ultimately. We just see the back end view, just forcing them up, and they've got nowhere to go. They can't go around the outside. And since, you know, you led the defensive line with England, we sort of adopted both, both strategies, didn't we? Yeah. We're going to have a little, little. Okay, this one's just a really quick one on the drift defense. Uh, I'd like to kind of point out. Oops. Hopefully this works. Oh, 
the defenders for Australia. What I'd like you to look for is where their hips are facing as the ball comes out. They're all pointed towards that sideline. They stay inside their marks, push them towards the edge, and use that sideline as that last defender. Okay? I have some more examples of blitz defenses. If it works, so that's off. So again, here's Japan. You love doing the blitz defense. See how fast their line speed is. It's driven backwards. See how they get numbers around the break over again. Okay. In a blitz defense, you'll see a lot of uh, gang tackling, tackling in numbers. Okay, again, blue here is going to be. On a blitz defense, the outside defenders are up farther than the inside defenders, trying to hit man and ball as soon as that pass connects. And that's what they're trying to create with the blitz defense, is those transition opportunities. You see players getting hit as they're trying to pass the ball, as they're trying to catch the ball. Okay, last one here. Again, it's about, it's kind of that basketball mindset of trying to see both the ball and your mark at the same time, so you can time that hit as soon as they catch the ball. All right, so the next thing I want to ask is, what factors go into choosing which style of uh, defense your team's going to run? So what are the decisions that you make there? Where are you going to go? Where you're at on the field? Okay, I'm thinking as a general concept, your team's okay. deciding between focusing primarily on one or the other. What are the factors you're thinking about, Amanda? Uh, fitness. Fitness of your players, yep. So which which bucket is which? So if, if you're not as fit of a team, a drift defense is probably the way to go because you don't need as much energy and as much kind of go forward commitment versus the avoid bringing fitter players to be kind of moving across the field. Yeah, 100% agree. If you've got a fitter team, the blitz makes a little bit more sense because you're going to have to get to width earlier. You're going to be up and back more often than you are for a drift defense. Good call. On the uh, proficiency of your tackling, if you've got a team that tackles really well, blitz is more your option. But if your guys are struggling with it, they need numbers for the drift option. Yep. So uh, another really, really good point, uh, proficiency in tackling. If you're running a blitz defense, you're going to put your defenders up on an island a little bit more. So we need to be more capable in the one-on-one -on -one tackle environment. A drift defense, you can get in those numbers, you can get more people into the tackle easier and just be more patient with it. Good call. Any other considerations we can think of? How aggressive your players are. How aggressive the makeup of your team is. Like, do you want to play super aggressive or do you want to be a little bit more passive? Like, there's not a right answer, it's just what fits your team makeup better. Great answer. So, I've got most of the things you guys are talking about. Drift, larger players, less fit players. Um, I put skilled in defensive breakdowns because both ways you're going to tr try and create turnovers. When you're doing a blitz defense, you're trying to create chaotic situations where they're throwing a questionable pass or you're picking it off. In a drift defense, you're more waiting phases, waiting phases until they have a breakdown that they don't have numbers too very early. Then you put your hands in there trying to win that breakdown. Um, again, the less sure tacklers, but spinner defenders, uh, aggressive mentality, skilled in the chaotic situations. Um, and just a call out on the bottom, no matter what you do, your team needs to be bought in on the idea. Like, you can't go to a team and say, hey, we're going to do a blitz defense. Good luck, guys. It's get everyone on the same page. Do we want to be super aggressive or do we want to focus that time in other areas of the game? So I wanted to go into, I had a, so when I started back with the WRC, uh, this would have been a year ago, a few years ago, something, huh? Um, we put in a blitz defense. So I think it was the first time uh, the Wisconsin Rugby Club had seen a blitz defense. Like 
you know, just like everybody else, we grew up playing drift defense, and that's all there was. Um, and I kind of learned that, that that the general principles of what you're trying to do in a uh, blitz defense, um, no matter what you're doing for either attack or defense, it's smart to put in some kind of terminology that makes it stick in people's minds. We called it a lumberjack defense. Okay, our goals. It was pile pressure on the opposition, force sloppy exits, make early quick tackles, and create transition opportunities. Yep, Jake? What do you mean by exit? Uh, exits are you're inside of your own 22, and you're just trying to get away from your own try line. Usually it's through setting up a kick that can clear your lines. Um, so we're trying to force the other team into sloppy exits. So as they're setting up their exit, we want to create opportunities to either force them into a bad kick or into a turnover uh, situation. Okay, these were our principles. Obviously outside in, press of line speed. Never pass the ball. Can someone tell me why, why we never wanted someone going past the ball? Yeah, so they said you're out of the play. What's the specific danger we're seeing there? Yeah, well, it's not offside, so we started outside. But say this is the fly half, they've got the ball, I'm defending the inside center and I go here, what can they do? Yeah. Throw, throw the ball behind me, run behind me, anything like that. So for us it was getting up even with the ball, and if we are even with the ball, we're hunting inside. Okay, we're going straight at that ball carrier. Um, obviously a, a quick down and tackle, and then back to our feet as quick as possible. Again, when you run this style of defense, you need all of your players up on the feet, spread out, so you can have line speed over and over and over again. I'll quickly go through some of our terminology, some of it we use a lot, some of it we don't. This is what was in my mind when I was putting this together. Um, we called our straight ahead running lines, straight ahead running options, oops, and out the back options, mostly bats, bushes, any trees, pot of oaks with no bush, woods, oaks with a bush, Field, first first receiver out to some oaks. Not super important, but again, you stick with the terminology, you stick with the lumberjack theme, players can remember it a little bit easier. Again, easy terminology, axe and saw are two different kinds of tackles. So if you see, from seeing out on defense, we're outside of our mark. Everyone outside of there is looking for a chop tackle with their axe. So up the field in chop tackle. Right there, that's where all of our assignments are. Okay, we're all looking to come from the outside in, try and time our hits. Everyone inside the, the ball is the saw. So someone steps back in, they're stepping into our saw. Just kind of showing the assignments as we go there. Where do we think the danger to our defense is right here? Okay, so why, yep, what kind of a pass is that? from this playmaker to that wing. Super easy. So, what, what was that? Super right. easy? <laughs> right. I mean, maybe. What we're hoping is these two players are aggressive enough where if that pass gets thrown, they're either intercepting or it's a really tough, you know, 20, 30 meter over the top skip pass. So we're kind of giving up that space to test their skills and to create chaotic situations. So that's what we're looking for, and this is that ball over the top. If they do pull it off, we still want our wing out there roaming, doing their thing. But then our saw, instead of being kind of angled this way, goes angled towards that sideline, and it forms that drift defense that people are used to. So we want to create chaotic situations. If they do get outside of us, we'll still go into that wedge towards the sideline, give up a little space on the outside to try and win that turnover. Okay, so here, just some I'm, more clips from Japan. Again, love watching them play defense. There's that kind of skip pass out to the wing, and if you're playing it right, like you give up a little bit of ground, but still, it's not gonna break your back. Now moving into what uh, our full policy was. So we're starting from a sideline. We've got a couple of pods set up. Our C is outside the first first threat. 
So we're looking for double tackles as much as possible. So watch it, we got B and C going into that, that tackle area. And how a normal defense that we learned, a normal drift defense, D would step into this post guard whatever position. For a blitz defense to be as effective as it can be, we want early whip. So these two are in the tackle. We're gonna have D line up outside their next first receiver. Okay? We're gonna expect work from these two players or the nine to fill the A and B channels there. Okay, so if everyone's doing the thing they should, A and negative A fold it over, nine can fill if needed, B and C roll away and form A and B on this side. Any questions on that that little piece of it there? Again, it's it's high risk, high reward. It takes time to have this become second nature, to have this have players look for the keys that we're looking for, but it can be really effective if people are bought into the idea. Okay, we're gonna see an example of Japan folding. So watch these players come around. They're not getting to a spot and stay. They're getting around and getting whipped right away. Specifically look for the first player that's not in that tackle on the far side and the whip they're looking for. We'll watch this another time through. Watch that first defender, he moves out, calls players over, and fills that inside. This allows them to get multiple people in, in tackles multiple faces in a row. Okay. These are just some of our more general ideas. The axe or chop tackle always has the next inside threat. So if I'm out at D or E, and I see my next inside guy going in, I also have to go with. Because if I don't, we're creating a big gap. So it's always next threat in, it's not only next, you're not always staying with your mark. So the idea is if B goes in on the nine, C has to go in and cover that, that gap that B's creating. Questions on that, that thought? Good. Kind of more specifically to the exit defense. Um, again, the primary objective is pressuring the kick as much as possible. Changing the de direction of the kick is a win. So if we make the kicker uncomfortable, they kick either too short or they kick inbounds, that's a win for, for our defense. Uh, if they do a box kick, we're gonna challenge by one of our four through eights, taller, taller players. And the clearance kick, for my, for my money, is best challenged by the nine. Someone super mobile that doesn't have a set defined role on the defense can be a little bit more rogue playing there. So this is just kind of walking through what that looks like. We're in a spot where the nine looks like they're gonna box kick. Our nine's gonna insert in a spot where they can get after that, that 10, that clearance kicker, by the way. Okay, and that's all there is to that one. Are there questions from either of the presentations, either the defense we were running or uh, more, more generally the uh, blitz versus drift defense. Yeah, just watching Japan do the uh, blitz defense there, they're not really contesting any rucks. Is that how you operate your defense as well? Get them yeah. in, get them out, get them reset? Go yeah, on. so the question is, when Japan's defending, it looks like they're not contesting any of the breakdowns. Is that how we, we kind of run it? And the answer is generally yes. So it's a different way of applying pressure to the other team's possession. So in a, in a drift defense, you're looking to go a couple phases, wait until they're short numbers, then really attack that breakdown. In a blitz defense, you're looking to get them going backwards multiple phases in a row and either force them to kick or get, get a, a pickoff, an intercepted pass, a big tackle behind the gain line that, that makes the ball go loose. Again. It's not a red light on putting hands on the ball, but it's more that yellow light. I was just going to ask. Yeah. Okay. So we still have players looking look to put hands on the ball, but it's, I would say, fewer times than in a drift defense. Uh, when you had your demonstration on folding, uh, your PowerPoint showed that the two A guys would, would pull over to fill that gap. However, when on a breakdown, aren't you supposed to have a one guy stay put just in case there's a banger ball outside of the ruck? So I guess in that case, when is it okay for both A guys to fill? Sure, I mean, and that's that's 100% on the tactics you use for your defense. It's very traditional thinking to have that A set and never move, just in case the nine takes, just in case there's a pick, a wing hits that spot. 
it's something that our defense is aware that that's that's our policy. So our first defender there is going to shift out to C, and then we need to fill either with players from the backside or the nine. So as long as your nine has it in their head that they're the emergency defender there, you're usually comfortable. But it's it, it's definitely something that takes practice, takes training. It's a good question. Is there some other thought there? No. Cool. No, I, I think that's an important consideration for sure. It's. It's very different from the, like, again, it took me a while to learn. It's very different from the defense that we're used to playing. Um, so this is that spot where, I'll tell you that. This is that spot where we're talking about. So normally this D would step into this spot. We're asking them to get here, and nine, for our team, nine is responsible to get these guys into the right spot. Do we have another hand in the back? Okay. Um, other thoughts, again, I know this is more about a blitz defense. Uh, for me, that's what I've been coaching for three or four years now. Um, I'm used to a drift defense as well. I personally think it's it's easier to, to get players more interested in the blitz defense just because it's new, just because it's more active, more aggressive, but it is a tougher defense to, to train and to pull off. Um, again, if you've got newer players and your team's always going to have newer players, that, that drift defense is easier and, and easier to teach. But the blitz, for me, has high risk, high reward. I kind of like playing that way in general. I like creating opportunities for our players. Can you switch it up in the game depending on where you're at in the field? Um, no. So it's not where we are in the field. It's more the specific situation. So if they have a blind side where they've got a four on two or a five on two, We'll yell out cold, so normally it's hot and cold. Normally hot is our base, and if you if we hear cold, 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 then it'll be that that kind of wedge towards the sideline by time to get the inside defenders in there. So we do have a call to switch into a drift style, but our base is is hot. Let's. Other questions? And he starts sliding out just like the Japanese player he's calling. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. You can do the same thing, but that's important that communication. For some reason, some coach once thought, you know, our players are going to automatically know when that means. No. Yeah. You've got to so Sherpa was saying that, you know, the C and D defenders, it's really big on them to be calling, calling people over to fill that A, B spot. And what we've learned and what I've learned over, over years, it's not, hey, Pull, pull, pull right, pull right, pull right. I need to say a name. I need to say, Sharpo, come right, Sharpo, come right. Because if I yell at this entire group, hey, ever, hey, take a step forward. Like, how many of you are going to take a step forward? Like, I need to say a name and then what I what I want. Other other questions or general ideas? Yep. What are your wings doing with defense? That's a great question. And I don't have that in either presentation. Um, so getting into this defense from a set piece, we're set up normally. Um, we've got our 10, 12, 13 up in the line. Uh, if we're kind of in our own half, the wing will be up in the line. If we're not in our own half, we'll have three deep for a kick. Um, but from that first breakdown, say they crash it up with a center, our 10 drops straight back. 10 and 15 are both back. So it's them and the blind side wing. So what we have up our wings do is 10 and 15 are back going side to side, the wings are doing this. So it's like that swinging gate idea just with two players back. For me, it takes kind of meters off of the wings. They don't have to go as far across the field and that allows them to be a little bit more aggressive on that outside end. So yeah, great question about the wings. When we'll get into our own red zone, into our own 22, then we'll have the fly half join the line and we'll only have the 15 back roaming. Uh, we do have the nine a little a little bit in that flat fan and third roll. They can kind of do whatever they want, but they're generally defending that chip zone or if some, someone's breaking through the line right there. If your nine goes into contact, do you pull your 10 in to take over for the next, no? No, so the question is if our nine has to be involved in the contact, do we adjust with another player like a 10 or a wing? The answer is no. Uh, we'll try and set up again as quick as possible, get our nine on their feet. We'll, we'll go a phase without the nine. Okay. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, it's it's player makeup. If you've got fit players, if you've got a really aggressive nine, it's a lot of fun to play. Hayden's a really good defensive nine in, in a blitz defense. Uh, a couple of games, he won man of the match because he tackled, 
tackle better than any of our forwards. Um, it's really fun to play with that, you know, that Guido type, that, that Bulldog 9. It's a, it's a fun defense to play. Uh, you can really free some of them up to go, you know, really disrupt the opposition. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to share the PowerPoint, all of my slides with our defense, anything like that with anybody interested. Uh, I'll kind of cut it off there, give you some time back, but, but I'll stay in your club to that. Yeah. First of all, it's because Caden had an excellent high school coach. <laughs> <laughs> Second, <laughs> so, so what are the weaknesses? What are you watching for for the weaknesses in each one? That's actually a great, great question, and I should have brought that up. Um, so let's ask the room first. In a drift defense, where are the weaknesses in that? The wings. The wings, yeah. So you're, you're likely to give up. 15 meters of space, 20 meters of space on the wing just to ensure that you shut it down. Yep, that's a good one. And I would say if there's a really good drift defense, that's really the only weakness because the rest of the field should be shut down. So let's put that into where do we think a weakness in a blitz defense would be? Inside channels. Why is that? Because you're right here coming out. Sure. Yeah, go in. So anything coming back in. All of our momentum is going out, and if they attack quickly, the inside. Because Again, in a, in a drift defense, the C is going to be inside the first receiver, okay? So already, we're going to have more space between defenders close to the ball, okay? So the weakness is right here, and then think about, so just watch these spaces. Where would another weakness be? So specifically here, let's say A and, and negative A don't do a good job forming, folding into that gap. Say 9 needs to fill there. Where's another weakness? Yep, chip, a chip kick right over the top of those those inside defenders. And professionally, that's where you see it. So a few years ago in the rugby championship, Argentina almost pulled off an upset, or did they pull off an upset over the All Blacks? So they got close. And all they did was they sent their, their weak side backs and they sent players through next to the breakdown. And Nicolas Sanchez would just do those little digs right over the top. And the All Blacks actually, actually adjusted their defense to be less of a blitz defense after that game. So if you can really attack those channels next to the breakdown, put those dinking kicks in, that's really effective against blitz. So, so if you don't have confidence in your uh, flying fullback, you wouldn't run a blitz. Every time a chip comes over. You uh, do you mean in kicking ability? Or? Um, well, I guess, I guess tackling. If a chip comes over, the offense comes through, and now you're 10 or 15 can that mm -hmm. or they can't come in they're not quick enough whatever yep. they can't make that tackle for whatever reason you, you wouldn't run this um if i could make up for that a different way so say you've got a, a wing that's a really good defensive player really quick you can switch them with either the 10 or the 15. um if you remember uh, there's there's teams that say they're coming from a lineup their 10 is a, is a terrible defender they don't want them isolated anywhere They'll put them where the uh, hooker usually is in a lineup and have them defend as a wing. And so, like, you can hide players like that certain places. In a blitz defense, that's usually a wing because when you're defending, you're flying up the field and there's not a lot of one up tackling. There's more like, I'm just trying to disrupt. Uh, so, you know, when when we did this at Lindenwood, we had a, an eight man who was a re re really explosive runner, really good in space, really fast. And so we didn't drop our 10, we dropped our eight. So then we had a 15 and an 8 back, and the 15 would kick, or we'd get to the 8 and he'd just counterattack. So you can you can kind of fudge it a little bit. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to throw that out there for you. If you have 15 people on your team, and you got <laughs> you, 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 you <laughs> somebody else on your team, put them where you can. <laughs> uh, other, other questions about kind of nuts and bolts of this? Again, if, if you want to bail and go use the bathroom, go get something to drink, go for it. Is there a specific offense that you would change your defensive plan midway through the game to want have an advantage over whatever they're doing? That's a really good question. Um, if I was playing a very big physical team and their you know, first few phases, after they hit a sideline, they're just hitting the first receiver forward, just bashing the... the game line over and over and over again, I'd probably get a little bit tighter, put multiple players in that tackle and try and mess with their breakdowns a bit more. So I, if, if there's a team that's trying to be super physical, 
not throwing the passes very much. That's that's a team I tighten up a little bit for. Um, this is meant like the bread and butter of this defense is a team that plays off of ten. Because when there's two passes that happen before a contact, you can take five to eight meters of space, no problem. If there's not two passes, you can't take that space as well. So that's that's a good consideration. Gary loves this defense. He just needs to tackle tackle better. Dude, I love this defense. <laughs> it's awesome. No, it's it's a lot of fun to play. Um, it's really tough to do. You gotta allow your players to make mistakes and, and just learn from them. Um, you're gonna get you're gonna get cut right up the middle of the field from time to time. You want your nine to be super active. You want your ten and fifteen to be good. Um, but again, there's, there's big games to make with this style. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Ben, for the question.